Hello friends, I'm Will Michael and you're watching Connecticut Naturalist. This week we have a special Halloween episode. You may hear in the background the noises of the infrastructure being established. I have a special guest this week. Without any further ado, I present the original cool ghoul, John Zachary. Oh, well, uh, Zachary here. I'm dusting off the old girl. Hello, honey. How are you? <laughs> oh, dear. I'm keeping the bloodline alive, my dear, if you understand what I'm saying. Hey? Isn't she a cutie? <laughs> way back. She goes way back here. Oh, here's an old friend, too. Edgar Poe gave me this. Remember Edgar Poe, the guy who wrote the Get Up Here and I Like You There? See? And uh, he's a little dusty, too, to tell the truth. That's <laughs> you! Whoa! Well, I'm Zachary, by the way, and this is my digs here in Manhattan in New York. And we're uh, entertaining the folks from uh, Bethel. Portland Hall has a play. He hangs out up there. And he's a great old boy. He's got the blood. Uh, speaking of bloodlines, this is a grandpa papa. Hey, a little, something got a little dirt on there, my boy. Uh, anyway, his, his grandpa was a uh, uh, court, Courtland Hall is uh, Henry Hall, the werewolf of London. So Cortland, who runs around in Connecticut there and up in that area, uh, he had a little museum there, I think, too. He, um, he's got that uh, horrible stuff in his blood. <laughs> Best stuff in the world, you know, really, really great. I'm going to move on down here while I'm doing my cleaning. Then, oh, here, here's something here. Here's my, I, when we have our heads matching, this is my, uh, what you call a rugby jacket. This is my number. And I get, usually get 18 guys knocked out, you know. Is what we count. That's how we go to numbers on the shirts. 18 is a pretty high number. I've been at it for years. <laughs> Grand old picture here. My, my great old friend, uh, Boris the Karloff. Grand old boy. He's the guy that got us all excited in the early 60s with old black and white. He was on television. Barbara McCormick did this in pastel. That's me in pastel. I'll check it out Fantastic. And, uh, beyond that, you see there, a real fine artist uh, doing the... Uh, Father Time thing, you know, with no flesh. <laughs> it's all gone, rotted away. The reason we're doing this here is to uh, let you know that up there in uh, Bethel, <laughs> they have that great thing, you know, with the pumpkins and all. And uh, Mr. Pumpkinhead himself is here in the background, and he's the guy that uh, organized the whole thing for years and years. And they sent me a copy of the tape, I guess it was from last year of the 500, five, five, I'll use my crooked finger here, 500, uh, now you behave yourself here, there. Uh, that's arthritis. If you get old enough, you get something, and this is what I got. <laughs> Isn't that ma it's amazing? It's, it's good for getting your ears and all that stuff. Anyway, uh, very hard to cell phones and cell phones. Uh, oh, and the, uh, the weekend The pumpkin man. Ah, oh, yes, the other day on the television. What do you do with all those pumpkins? 500 pumpkins after it's all over. He says, Well, we put them in a truck, we take them out in the dump, and they desiccate. It's just like, you know, a, a funeral where they forget to bury people and they just rot away and go down into the earth and make very rich soil. So it's all recycled. I was driving through Hartford, Connecticut years ago. Uh, I used to go right on through it because I didn't think there was any, anything interesting there. But then a friend of mine was in that great big old-fashioned hospital that, that there for a while, so I stopped to see him. And one day I wandered through downtown, and I passed a theater. And up on the theater was 
uh, the billboard for what was going to be there. Shakespeare, I think it was. And uh, now I've already forgotten this guy's name. Uh, Richard Thomas. It's Richard Thomas in some kind of Shakespeare. I thought, wow, this is me and Richard Thomas. Are you ready for this? Years ago, this little kid had an NBC show all his own. And uh, that's me and him out in front of this old empty house out there in Long Island. And we did a whole show about a show, a shoe show, a shoe show. <laughs> I left my shoes off so you can see the hole in my socks. But we'll show you that later. At any rate, this is a great picture. And I, the house was astonishing. It was empty and all the raggy windows. See all the curtains are all raggedy and all. It's too bad. I'm sure it's not there anymore. The, the rumor was that it was some uh, relative of uh, Jackie Onassis' family. This was done by a lady named Gretchen Sharpless, who uh, get a good shot of it. Is it too bright or what? Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> How about that? You're perfect. <laughs> uh, we used to use that on the TV show there with. Uh, we were doing all our experiments and so on. And that's where Billy the Michaels got excited. Incidentally, somebody told me last night, if I wander, it's because I'm getting older. Uh, last night told me that the Bobby Pickett called and he wants to come and sing Monster Mash with me. I'm only saying that's not my song, it's his song. I don't want people to get confused. I did dinner with Jack, if you're, if you're old enough to remember that. But he did the Monster Mash. And he wants to come to the convention and sing it with me up on the stage. We have a grand party on uh, Sunday night there. Cameraman was sitting on the pistol underneath the lens. He was shooting, so he was shooting right up there. I was hanging away, you know, uh, called Il Drop. And it was a couple of months. Never been in the phone system in the history of opera. One of the big problems out there is, is, uh, is finding my way around it. Just, uh, you know, what are you going to do? The problem is, of course, my toenails and my fingernails are sharp, extremely sharp. And that's cuts through there, and I don't mind at all. I, in fact, I think it's kind of neat. I don't think my toes, you see. And occasionally, I, I sharpen them, because sharp, you know, I can shave with these. Really can. This is this picture that was on the uh, famous monsters, right? Yeah. This is a copy of them. That's <laughs> Once again, I'll take a picture to point to the little thing here that the, uh, that the artist put on. I think he thinks it looks like me. Everybody picked, they picked up all over the country. It was a big deal. And uh, they put the movies on late at night so they wouldn't scare the children. My, my brother-in-law gave me a lot of old medical instruments that he got from the hospital because hospitals are always chucking things out because there's a new kind of forceps, a new kind of this and that. And so we used them. And then we had to figure out what we we're going to do. The first thing we did was a big piece of liver. And we told everybody that was a heart, you know, a heart transplant. And we drilled a hole in the top of the table and I put a dowel under there up to the liver. And I would work my foot and it would bounce up and down. And then, of course, occasionally the dowel would come right up through the, <laughs> through the liver. That didn't matter. You know, it was great. Then we, uh, we figured that brains, uh, cauliflower looked like brains. And then one, uh, and we smeared it up and make it look s s uh, slippery and all. And uh, I'd operate on the brain and take a bad part out and then eat it, you know. And, we're, we're shooting a f little flick here at the moment. We're cutting, shooting, shooting a little thing for the uh, pumpkin festival up in uh, Bethel, Connecticut. Oh, that's all right. What the hell? Yeah, yeah. Once upon a time, that time being now, in a pumpkin patch in New Milford, Connecticut, thousands of pumpkins waited patiently for Halloween to arrive. 560 lucky pumpkins are being selected to participate in a jack-o'-lantern festival in Bethel, Connecticut. 
Halloween enthusiasts march through this field and collect the pumpkins. It takes a lot of time to move 560 out of this giant garden and into the beds of trucks. The chosen pumpkins are loaded up and driven from New Milford down to Bethel, where the celebration will begin. They're unloaded and piled high. Yes, there are 560 pumpkins in that pile. Then, holes are cut into the tops, or bottoms, and the seeds and pulp are scooped out. This is the most daunting task. The initial pile slowly decreases in size as a new pile of hollow pumpkin is created. Setting up scarecrows and other preparations are underway as the pumpkins continue to move along the production line. <laughs> the energy level and excitement increases as more volunteers arrive to participate in the festival. Scaffoldings are erected in the backyard. Soon they'll be covered with glowing jack-o'-lanterns. Cowbirds and sparrows explore the pile as they search for seeds in the garden. Enthusiasm fills the autumn air. The leaves tumble down from the trees and seem to dance in the crisp sunlight. Yes, autumn in New England. There's no prettier season. All the pumpkins are nearly hollowed now. Just a few more. I made an invisible chicken one time. <laughs> that was great. This is the pile of hollowed pumpkins, all waiting patiently to undergo their metamorphosis into smiling, glowing jack-o'-lanterns. Friends smile and laugh as the next day begins. It's time to carve the pumpkins. This is the most fun. Everyone has different ideas and techniques. Adults and children are all united in this effort. And I think that this is a pumpkin patch most sincere. You know, the one that Linus was looking for in the cartoon. It's the great pumpkin Charlie Brown. This is Brenton Vaughn, a staple at Halloween on Hudson Street. Since Brenton was a young boy, he has been carving pumpkins. He is a skilled artist now, and every year he dazzles audiences with his remarkable carving style. All his jack-o'-lanterns are carved freely, no stencils. All the details are from his own mind. Another masterpiece complete by Master Carver Brenton Vaughn. People often ask why we do this. My parents started this tradition 22 years ago. In the beginning, only 25 pumpkins decorated the property. Each year, the volume increased, and now we've set a new record with over 500. <laughs> All of this work for one night only. Why do we do it? Well, it's the process that is the most fun. The journey is where the excitement lies. People come from miles around to contribute a jack-o'-lantern face that is unique only to the one who creates it. Old friends and new friends. People that we've never met. People that were strangers before, but because of the call of the jack-o'-lanterns are now comrades. It's amazing how many friends have been made because of Halloween. It makes me wonder, are we doing this for the pumpkins or are they doing something for us? I guess it's a mutualistic relationship. Human and pumpkin working side by side, each one bringing something to the other that he could not give himself. When twilight descends, the yard is most scenic. The pumpkins radiate an orange halo around them. It's surreal. Children play around the pumpkins. What an experience. The smiles on the faces of the people. That is why we continue the extravaganza. There's a feeling of experience.
experiencing fantasy here. Among the people and pumpkins, there is some kind of mystical energy. You can feel the excitement and anticipation. There's a joy in the air. I love this kind of TV. <laughs> Sometimes, the setting appears to be out of a fairy tale book. But think about it. The most incredible stories always exist in reality. And as if this were a fictional story, the moon goes according to script. What are the chances of a lunar eclipse as we're carving under the night sky of October? The earth is positioned between the sun and the moon as we work. The shadow of the earth is passing over the moon. Underneath the moonbeams, cheer and fun continues. Nobody could invent most of the extraordinary tales that happen every day in the world of non-fiction. What are the chances of a lunar eclipse at this time? Maybe the pumpkins called to the moon, or maybe the moon cried out to the pumpkins. Maybe we are just vessels for a lunar pumpkin celebration. Hours drift by, and the Earth's shadow grows longer across the moon. <laughs> Our friends have all gone home now, until tomorrow. This is Joe. He's been present at Halloween for the past 22 years. You better laugh out there. Something's out to get you. The firelight flickers on our flag, and the night is quiet and peaceful. Who knows what tomorrow has in store for us. The next day, a chipmunk and some sparrows gather seeds before the pumpkin crew returns. The pixie from the Danbury Fair looks over the yard. Pictures are taken. As they say, pictures are worth a thousand words. This is what America needs more of. Outdoor experiences. The smell, the touch, the taste, the sight and sound of living. All this work must be tiring for somebody. Bella does the sleeping on our behalf. <laughs> Another evening arrives. Tarps are set up. Electrical lines are strung. Carving continues. Wheelbarrows are pushed. Ladders are climbed. The process moves steadily forward. A lot of people show up from Hollywood. scary because you're afraid you'd touch me, you'd fall over and die or something. Some of the nicest people that you'll ever meet in your life are here tonight. How privileged we are to have their company. I have to take a moment and just watch and remember. There is a romantic quality about being outside in the cool autumn air, with a series of overhead incandescent light bulbs illuminating the workbenches.
morning is the morning. Today is Halloween. Volunteers count pumpkins. Some didn't make it from beginning to end due to decomposition and other factors. The total number of pumpkins on display this Halloween is about 535. The afternoon sun shines over the property. The orange flesh of the jack-o'-lanterns mirrors the light. The exit sign is brought in. The cherry on the ice cream sundae. We're ready for the hundreds, over a thousand visitors that will be here to view the pumpkins. Or maybe I have it backwards. Over a thousand visitors will arrive to be viewed by the pumpkins. Outside the fence looking in, the yard is temporarily closed. That's John Zachary, an inspiration behind this process. Without him, this extravaganza might never have continued for so long. <laughs> Forest Floor has come to see the display. Clouds float overhead as the day begins to fade. The pumpkin flag now flies. This is it. The cowbirds fly away to spend their night in a quieter location. We take an overhead look at it all. They are waiting. We are waiting. The smudge pot is lit. The flame of Halloween. It is here again for another year. Why don't you have this show on Good Friday? That would really upset people and uh, start a big commotion. You get all kinds of publicity. <laughs> One thing that I've noticed is that many spectators do not bother dressing up in costumes. This is somewhat sad. Where is the Halloween spirit? There are only a handful of people in the world that produce events like this for free open to the entire public. It's these small groups that make the holiday season fun for everyone. Not just Halloween, but other days as well. If more people masqueraded in costume, it would be even more surreal. With all the creativity that is here, you would think that others would pick up on it and bring some of their own inventiveness. After all, the pumpkins are putting on a show for us. Shouldn't we give them something in return? Now here is a friend who has the Halloween spirit. When you do something creative, everyone around you is inspired. I urge all of those viewing the program tonight, wear a costume on Halloween, the only night of the year that you can, without having people think you're crazy. I like my costume so much, I could wear it all year round. You'll see it before the program ends, don't worry. If you ever find yourself saying, it hardly seems like Halloween, you have only yourself to blame. It's up to you to bring the excitement to others. How long have I been in this dream? That's my costume, a giant alien slinky that dances around. It's a lot of fun to spin around all Halloween night.
When the crowd cease to enter the yard, the deep Halloween torch erupts, and its flames signal the success of another All Hallows' Eve. This is the most enjoyable time. A few people remain around the fire and bask in the glow of the shining faces. Well, friends, we've come to the end of this week's episode. I'm Will Michael, and you've been watching Connecticut Naturalist. I hope to see you all on Halloween. Stay tuned in the weeks to come as we get back into Connecticut wildlife. Say bye-bye, whatever you are. <laughs>